Chapter Four of Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pa Gonzales. Chapter Four. Near to her father's house was a range of mountains. Some of them were, literally speaking, cloud-capped, for all them clouds continually rested and gave grandeur to the prospect and down many of the sides little bubbling cascades ran till they swelled the beautiful river through the straggling trees and bushes the wind whistled and all of them the bird song particularly the robins they also found shelter in the ivy of an old castle a haunted one as the story went it was situated on the brow of one of the mountains and commanded a view of the sea this castle had been inhabited by some of her ancestors and many tales had the old housekeeper told her of the worthies who had resided there. When her mother frowned, and her friend looked cool, she would steal this retirement, where human foot seldom trod, gaze in the sea, observe the grey clouds, or listen to the wind which struggled to free itself from the only thing it impeded its course. When more cheerful, she admired the various dispositions of light and shade, the beautiful tints, the gleams of sunshine gave to the distant hills, then she rejoiced in existence, and darted into futurity. One way home was through the cavity of a rock, covered with a thin layer of earth, just sufficient to afford nourishment to a few stunted shrubs and wild plants, which grew on its sides, and nodded over the summit. A clear stream broke out of it, and ran amongst pieces of rocks fallen into it. Here twilight always reigned. It seemed a temple of solitude, yet paradoxical. As the assertion may appear, when the foot sounded on the rock, it terrified the intruder and inspired a strange feeling, as if the rightful sovereign was dislodged. In this retreat she read Thoms and Seasons, Young's Night Thoughts, and Paradise Lost. At a little distance from it were the huts of a few poor fishermen, who supported their numerous children by their precarious labour. In these little huts she frequently rested, and denied herself every childish gratification in order to relieve the necessities of inhabitants. Her heart yearned for them, and would dance with joy when she had relieved their wants, or afforded them pleasure. In these pursuits she learned the luxury of doing good, and the sweet tears of benevolence frequently moistened her eyes, and gave them a sparkle which, exclusive of that, they had not, on the contrary, they were rather fixed, and would never have been observed if her soul had not animated them. They were not at all like those brilliant ones which look like polished diamonds and dart from every superfice, giving more light to the beholders than they receive themselves. Her benevolence, indeed, knew no bounds, the distress of others carried her out of herself, and she rested not till she had relieved or comforted them. The warmth of her compassion often made her so diligent that many things occurred to her, which might have escaped a less interested observer. In like manner, she entered with such spirit into whatever she read, and the emotions thereby raised were so strong that it soon became a part of her mind. Enthusiastic sentiments of devotion in this period actuated her. Her creator was almost apparent to senses in his works, but they were mostly the grand or solemn features of nature, which she delighted to contemplate. She would stand and behold the waves rolling, and think of the voice that could steal a tumultuous deep. These propensities gave the colour to her mind, before the passion began to exercise the tyrannic sway, and particularly pointed out those which the soul would have a tendency to nurse. Years after, when wandering through the same scenes, her imagination had strayed back, to trace the first placid sentiments they inspired, and she would earnestly desire to regain the same peaceful tranquillity. Many nights she sat up, if I may be allowed the expression, conversing with the author of nature, making verses and singing hymns of her own composing. She considered also, and tried to discern, what end her various faculties were destined to pursue, and had a glimpse of a truth, which afterwards more fully unfolded itself. She thought that only an infinite being could fill the human soul, and that when other objects were followed as a means of happiness, the delusion led to misery, the consequence of disappointment. Under the influence of ardent affections, how often has she forgot this conviction, and has often returned to it again, when it struck her with redoubled force? Often did she taste and mix delight, her joys, her ecstasies, arose from genius. 
She was now fifteen, and she wished to receive the holy sacrament, and perusing the scriptures, and discussing some points of doctrine which puzzled her. She would sit up half the night, her favourite time of employing her mind. She did plainly perceive that she saw through her glass darkly, and that the bounds set to stop our intellectual researches is one of the trials of a probationary state. But her affections were roused by the display of divine mercy, and she eagerly desired to commemorate the dying love of her great benefactor. The night before the important day, she was to take on herself a baptismal vow. She could not go to bed. The sun broke in on her meditations, and found her not exhausted by her watching. The orient pearls were strewed around. She hailed the morn, and sung with well delight, Glory to God on high, good will towards men. She was indeed so much affected when she joined in a prayer for eternal preservation, that she could hardly conceal her violent emotions, and the recollection never failed to wake a dormant piety when earthly passions made it grow languid. These various movements of her mind were not commented on, nor were the luxuriant sheets restrained by culture. The servants and the poor adored her. In order to enable to gratify herself in the highest degree, she practised the most rigid economy, and had such power over her appetites and whims, that without any great effort she conquered them so entirely, that when her understanding or affections had an object, she almost forgot she had a body, which required nourishment. This habit of thinking, this kind of absorption, gave strength to the passions. It will now enter the more active field of life. End of chapter 4 Recording by Pogonzales in Cavite, Philippines.